Hello, everybody. Nice to meet here, everyone here. So welcome to uh, the program of the American Space Almaty and the uh, programming which is happening for because of the US embassy initiatives. And thanks to our amazing guest, uh, Joe O'Connell, who is going to represent his home city, Chicago. Uh, Joe is the uh, English teacher and he is currently in Astana, in North Sultan actually. Uh, who is in the Quality Schools International in Astana. Uh, today he will talk about the, uh, his home city, about this, the, its neighborhood, and you will have a chance to ask whatever question about this city you have, or during the presentation, please use our chat box. Um, and if you have some questions, and we will discuss it during and after the presentation. Uh, also a very big, like request for you guys uh please mute yourself uh unless you don't have any questions because we want to be polite and not to distract our presentation from like not being uh distracted by noises uh and i'm giving the floor to joe thank you very much for um uh, agreeing to provide this amazing presentation and i'm making you a host so here you go. Okay, Thank it says you. I'm now host. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everyone. Well, actually, first, before I do that, before I start my presentation, um, I see a couple people say they've already been to Chicago, and it's great that you're giving positive uh, memories, saying it was wonderful, it was amazing. I, I agree with the Pavlodar observation about winter and then road construction, trying to make repairs from the winter, very true. Um, so I don't know if anyone had questions about Chicago in any way, something you were wondering about or you may have heard, but you're not sure if it's true. And also I'm glad to see you know what Chicago pizza is. It's something very special. It is not like pizza from anywhere else in the world. It's not like Italian pizza, not like New York pizza. <laughs> you need a knife and a fork and one slice will, will fill you up as a complete dinner. Um, um, let's see, what I will do is I'll, I'm going to start sharing my screen, which will be a presentation that I made because as I described to you what Chicago neighborhoods are like, it's, I think, very helpful to see uh, both sometimes a map of where they are in relationship to each other, as well as some pictures of what the neighborhoods maybe look like, um, some of the, what their personality is like. So I'm going to turn on the screen sharing and... So hopefully here we are. So is it the PowerPoint is showing for everyone? Yes. Yes, Maybe. we can see this. Okay, good. So um, I wish I could make it a little bit bigger, but I don't know how to get rid of the dock at the bottom. So, eh. so like I said, the, the, what I'm going to talk about today, what I'm hoping is uh, interesting for you is um, about the neighborhoods of Chicago, because it's something that um, is noteworthy in a lot of cities, but Chicago is just one of them where people don't just identify as being from Chicago, but also very strongly as being from the particular neighborhood that they're from, that each neighborhood has such a strong sense of its own culture and its own history and its own character. Um, they're very, sometimes very different from one another. So that's why it's something I thought would be interesting to, to share. Since I, I'm from Chicago and I'm on my dad's side, the third generation, my mom's side, the fourth generation being from this one city. So I have deep roots and a deep connection with it. Um, and I use the phrase here, a mosaic and a melting pot. And just want you to keep that in mind because in the end, I'll be able to draw out some of what does that mean? Why am I calling it a mosaic and a melting pot? Like I'll, I'll explain in the end that hopefully it will make some sense after we learn a little about the history of Chicago. So um, first, I don't know if everyone is aware of where Chicago is. I was describing a little bit during the, um, the little intro we were having, little intro chat, that it's in the 
it's almost the very center of the North American continent. And so that's why it's pinned here, not on the East Coast, not on the West Coast. It kind of prides itself on being the, the capital or the most important large city here in the very middle of America, um, being a center of business and commerce and everything really for the central part of the United States that we call the Midwest. So if we zoom in though, to look at the city itself, this is an outline. All this red here is the city today, surrounded by lots of suburbs, lots of towns around it. And so um, you might notice one of the most important parts of Chicago is this right here, Lake Michigan. It's one of the Great Lakes, one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. And it makes such a character of the city. As you can see, the city is pretty narrow east and west, but it's very long north to south because it just runs all along the lakefront here, that that lakefront is a huge part of what makes Chicago what it is and why it is where it is. So uh, before diving into the history, uh, one thing that might be helpful to understanding the neighborhoods is understanding the sides of Chicago. So like in Nur Sultan, we have two big parts of the city, the right bank and the left bank. And within that, then people break up and describe where they're from. And New York will have its five boroughs, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island. Within those then, people have their individual neighborhoods that they say where they're from. So in Chicago, we have the sides of the city, which um, <clears throat> I'll kind of point out with my cursor here. So our downtown, our city center is right here, not in the center of the city, it's on the lakefront but that's where the city kind of started historically and expanded growing out. And the north side is up here from the lakefront going into the river, which you'll see on a few maps, that there's a river here. And that's the north side. The northwest is this area. And depends on who you ask. Does it end at Grand Avenue, an angled street? Does it end at North, Ave north Avenue here? Um, it depends, and that's important because it's like the neighborhoods. Sometimes people don't all agree on where the neighborhood boundaries are. So the Northwest side, so here's Grand Avenue, here's North Avenue. The West side is one of those <laughs> down here too. There's a canal, which you'll also see on some better images next, the West side. And then the South side is all the rest. Some people say they're from the Southwest side if they're from some peripheral areas, but the Southwest side itself is even part of the South side, it's not really its own thing on its own. So let's see if we can, whoops, I wanna hide the, cause I don't know if it's covering your screen that I have the chat box open, there we are. <clears throat> so the first parts of Chicago to have permanent settlement is that city center that I told you about our downtown called the Loop. Um, actually it was not really settled much by Native Americans because it was a swamp. It was where the river flowed into the lake. And since it was the mouth of a river on very, very flat land, it was swampy, marshy, it was not good for living on. So a lot of the early settlers that came from the east, the white settlers who settled there because they wanted to settle where the river met the lake, it was good for trade and commerce. Um, the natives thought they were kind of crazy for settling in a place that they called Chicagoa which is the place of smelly onions because it stank from wild onions that grew in the swamps. But that's where they settled and that's where the name Chicago comes from. And I put over here, so we'll look at some of the early history, which is the 1830s, the first kind of settlement as a town growing up to the Civil War when it started to transform from a town into really being a very big, important city. And an important part of this history before we get into the city is why Chicago is located where it is. Why did people settle there and develop into this major city, this huge city? And it has a lot to do with canals, which are man-made waterways. And two canals that made Chicago are, the first one was the Erie Canal, which on the map, if you see up here, it cuts across New York State. And what that did was it connected through the Hudson River, New York City to the Great Lakes up here. So it made it possible for a huge part of inland America to connect to the ports in New York City. 
And what explorers decided was one of the best locations to connect then the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River was right around here, where there's a pretty short bit of land that would connect Lake Michigan to the Illinois River through digging a canal. And so they eventually dug what's called the I and M Canal or the Illinois and Michigan Canal connecting the Illinois River to Lake Michigan, meaning we're connecting the Great Lakes and ultimately to the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico and New Orleans. So lots of shipping, lots of stuff being able to go all over then the central part of America, which was being settled in the early and mid 1800s to major ports down in New Orleans and on the East Coast. So that's why Chicago is here and why that lake is so important and why the canal, which you're gonna see on the next couple slides is also very important. So who were the people that settled Chicago very early on? Growing up in school, being from the area, we were always taught this word, the New England Yankees were the early settlers. And this meant people from um, this region in the Northeast, this Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, upstate New York, Connecticut. A lot of these people, because the canal was here, were some of the earliest settlers to establish Chicago. And usually there were people who settled there thinking, we know a canal is going to be built. A lot of industry and shipping is gonna happen here. There's lots of money to be made. So they all went out there to invest really, to buy up property and build up a city out of just flat prairie, like the steppes of Kazakhstan. It was just flat prairie. Um, unfortunately, one of the important events in early Chicago history is what's called the Black Hawk War, which is when um, early on, the settlers made a treaty with local native tribes to uh, settle land basically around where they wanted to dig a canal. But then so many white settlers were coming from the east, there was just more and more demand to settle more land. And so the natives felt threatened and um, a war started between the two groups. Now the um, white Americans won the war and decided to expel the native tribes. Oops, let me go up here to this map again not just from Chicagoland, because they knew a lot of people were coming, but to push them all the way west of the Mississippi River here. So even today, out here in Iowa, Minnesota, they have a lot more Native Americans than we do in Illinois. So like I said, kind of a sad part of our early history and why today even Illinois, Chicagoland has very, very low populations of Native Americans as opposed to states nearby like Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa that have much larger tribes up there. But eventually Chicago started to grow. And who started to settle there? Early on, it was Irish and German immigrants. These were the big um, early settlements. So much so that when the city started as a town in the 1830s, it was a tiny town, just 200 people, a few traders, um, and like I said, very early settlers who were hoping to, to make money. Once the canal was dug, the city started to grow rapidly though. So you could see in just a generation or two, by the American Civil War has over 100,000 people from just 200 in less than 30 years. And it went from being mostly New England Yankees to being a city that is very roughly about 20% only were these Americans from the East Coast and then about 40% Irish immigrants and 40% German immigrants. And those groups are gonna have a huge influence on the culture of early Chicago. So what I did was I zoomed in on these maps and this part here, this is modern maps of Chicago. So that's why there's all these streets and highways that did not exist in the 1800s. But this central part here, the loop we call it is our downtown. And people started to settle mostly along the water because water was how things got shipped, how people traveled, how they moved to sell their, their produce if they grew things on a farm or the things they manufactured. And so to, some of the oldest neighborhoods grew north of the city up here, where you'll see it's called Lincoln Park and Lakeview. And a lot of Irish settled up here and a lot of Germans settled even farther north from this. Going south, oh sorry, that's also I wanna point out the, the Chicago River that flowed into Lake Michigan is very short. It's this little bit here. It's, it's I don't know, in kilometers, maybe two kilometers long. It's not a long, big river, but it splits into what's called the North Branch of the Chicago River, which goes way off this map and actually goes pretty far north. And the South Branch, which isn't very long, it just winds down here and kind of ends, or you might say begins here. 
Now you'll notice coming off the South Branch though is a very straight river here. And the reason that's so straight is because that's not a river. That's the canal that was dug by those early settlers. So I don't know if there's questions maybe here. So well, yes, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Joe, I see there are a lot of questions. And oh, uh, actually, one of the participants, Denise, is from Chicago. So I was wondering, is she like originally Irish or German? And I have the same question like to you, like, the, are you German or Irish? So yeah, please uh, check the questions. Yeah. All right. So my, my family is, is Irish, and, but we, we were not that old. Our family came uh, more around the early 20th century. So we were a later generation that settled in Chicago that we'll actually talk about later, that there's different kinds of Irish. They call themselves North Side, South Side, West Side. So the earliest ones were these North Side and then South Side Irish. Um, like I said, the North one settling here between the river and the lake. And then the Irish who dug this canal, because a lot of the workers who came from Ireland came because there were jobs digging a canal. And a lot of them, their payments for their work was not just money, it was being given land down around this point where the canal meets the river. So that's this neighborhood called Bridgeport, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Chicago, also developed as a very, um, very Irish neighborhood, whereas the Germans tended to settle farther north with the north side Irish up here. But you see people settled near the water, near the lake, near the river, near the canal. It was just where the jobs were for shipping because Chicago became a major hub. And so even today, some of the oldest neighborhoods with lots of old buildings and old architecture um, are in these areas on the north side along the lakefront and then down south along um, Bridgeport. But downtown Chicago, the center, even though it was the earliest part to be settled by permanent white settlers, um, was not, it does not have very many old buildings because if you look at pictures of downtown, it's all skyscrapers, it's the center. So of course, buildings were being torn down and taller buildings being built. Then those were torn down and even taller buildings were built. So downtown doesn't have a ton of historic architecture. Really, um, some of these neighborhoods are where you'll find much older buildings. So Chicago started to transform um, in the second part here, the next 50 years or so. After the Civil War, like a lot of America, it started becoming very industrialized. So a lot of factories being built and a lot of immigrants and people coming to Chicago because of industrial jobs. Also in 1871, a fire happened that destroyed, uh, I, I forget the exact, maybe about a third of Chicago. But the important thing is it destroyed the main parts, like the downtown, the central part was just wiped out by this fire. And so the city being rebuilt and being rebuilt now as a major large city, not as a town, um, really changed the city. So as I said, industrialization, I put was one of the turning points after the Civil War of Chicago's growth. Also, just at that time period, technology was changing and all over, the main way of shipping and transporting things was changing from being water, being um, canals and rivers to being then uh, railroads. And Chicago, because it already was in the very center of the continent and already was a transport hub, became the railroad hub for the continent, not just the country. And that's still a big part of what makes Chicago very important today is how much uh, freight, goods, as well as people get transported, shipped through Chicago. Um, part of this also is as, actually I'm gonna go back a few slides if I can, to this map of America. As people started settling farther and farther west, a lot of farms and ranches developed out here and their produce as well as their animals started getting shipped to Chicago to then get shipped farther east to ports on the east coast. And animals, typically animal meat, it doesn't last for very long before refrigerators. So you'd have to ship animals all the way to Philadelphia, all the way to New York, all the way to Boston before they can even be slaughtered. It was very inefficient. Um, animals had to be tended and dealing with their waste and everything all along the way. But when they invented refrigerated railroads, this changed everything. Because now animals could be shipped from the ranches out west to Chicago, 
be slaughtered in kind of a, a systematic, almost industrial fashion, large scale slaughtering, and then their meat um, processed and packed onto refrigerated railroads and shipped east. So Chicago became a major, major center for what's called meat packing um, in a place called the Stockyards, which is where millions of animals would come into Chicago and get slaughtered, get, the, get um, the meats being cut into parts to be frozen or refrigerated and shipped off to markets in cities on the East Coast and everywhere on the continent. So Chicago booms. It becomes a major city. As you'll see from 1860, just over 100,000. 30 years later, we're over a million. And it's the second largest city in the United States and one of the fastest growing cities in the world. 20 years later, it doubles again to over 2 million people. So it's a, it's a busy, busy time with a lot growing. Um, I wanted to click on the conversation because I saw there were some comments of questions, but I can't quite get it to pop up. So I don't know. Are there questions coming up over there? Uh, there are not like essential okay. questions, but we have some comments. And thank you, Denise, for sharing your uh, favorite parts and like uh, your comment about the Chicago. Uh, like, so yeah, Denise, if you don't mind, can you un unmute yourself maybe and talk a little bit more about uh, where are you from and uh, the origin of your family? Sure, I, I'm from the north side. Um, as Joe said, we tend to um, uh, affiliate with a side. So I'm from the north side. My family is all from the north side. I live in Chicago. Um, you'll find when you talk to people as you travel, a lot of people say they're from Chicago, but yet they're really not from Chicago. They live outside of Chicago, but because we're so big, they affiliate us with Chicago. So what is the difference like between from Chicago or like a little bit uh, far from the city? What are the features like of the people, like characteristics of the people who are from Chicago uh, compared to people who are not from Chicago? Um, when you're from Chicago, you have a certain pride and as even when my kids would travel, they would get upset saying, oh, someone's from Naperville, which is a suburb outside of Chicago. And they say they're from Chicago. And people who truly are from Chicago, they have this pride. As Joe said, you know, we are a city of, of immigrants. Um, this city was built by immigrants and it's got a rich cultural diversity history and we take pride in that. And there's just something when you say you're from Chicago, you affiliate with the city. Um, Joe talked a little bit about the Chicago fire. Um, it pretty much destroyed the city. And who rebuilt it was immigrants. So we take pride in this beautiful big city that was built by people from everywhere. Totally understand. Thank you very much. It really makes sense. And yeah. uh, Joe, if do you want to uh, answer a lot of questions also, people who've been there? I didn't really see. I saw someone ask about vegetarian and I just made a comment I typed in there saying that Chicago has all kinds of peoples and culture. So yeah, there's lots of vegetarian, vegan, every, every type of national cuisine you can find there because we are a city with people from all over the world and who live all different types of lifestyles. So almost anything you want, you can find there. Thank you very much. And I saw some people that have been to Chicago from our uh, Kazakh uh, uh, participants. So do you mind who, who you, you know, been visit, uh, in Chicago, just like unmute yourself and let us uh, hear from you what uh, the impressions that you got about Chicago so we can all share and maybe uh, Joe can uh, give you some ideas. Okay, so thank you very much. If uh, you want uh, to, to uh, answer their questions, Joe, uh, that you get received from chat, please do. Oh, there it is. Sometimes I can access the chat box and sometimes I can't really pull it up, but I see just scrolling back a little bit. 
So see someone has been to Naperville, it is very nice. That's close to where I went to college, was um, in a town right next to Naperville. Um, I mean, there's, the city itself is so diverse and we're gonna get to see as I made in this presentation, like the neighborhoods as the city expanded from that central part, um, it's going to different parts of the city. You feel like you're going to different worlds almost because um, they're from, there's so much diversity in them. So, yeah. <laughs> So, and then, and then I can connect this back if I wanna pick up my presentation again, that um, Chicago, it's, it's really becoming diverse started in the time period that I was talking about that after the Civil War time period, because before that it was, like I said, pretty much people from the Northeastern US who might've been old English or British stock, um, Irish and Germans, and it was not much diversity beyond that. But after the Civil War, you start getting lots more immigrants coming from various parts of the world. And we sort of become, a center for Eastern and Central Europeans, for Slavic. So still today, Chicago is kind of understood as like the Polish capital of America and a place with huge communities from uh, who are Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Czechs and Bohemians, Greeks. Um, it's, it's a major center for people from Eastern Europe. All the people started to come from everywhere and settle at this time. Like I said, you can see at the bottom of the screen, if you're looking at the presentation, you know, it went up by almost tenfold in 30 years and then the next 20 years it doubles yet yet again so the city was growing extremely rapidly people were coming from all over mostly it was for jobs because chicago was had tons of tons of jobs in in uh industry meat packing shipping and transport so people were coming for that and helped to now build a big city and one of the big places i have here if you're seeing the map is um the west side of chicago is where a lot of people started to settle at this time because the north side uh was the older part of the city and a lot of the wealthier, those again, old stock um, Americans settled up there as long as a lot, of, a lot of the Irish and Germans who had already been here. Um, the South side had its big Irish communities. Um, a lot of industry started to be built, but the West side developed as a residential area in the late part of the 1800s. And it became a very diverse part where a lot of different ethnic groups settled. So I just thought I would go one by one and show you some of the neighborhoods where a lot of these people settled. Um, you'll see on the left side there, the Italian. So if, just for context, the loop is the downtown. So everything over here on the far right would be water, that's the lake. And down here would be the south parts, up here is the north parts. So the west side is everything straight west. So our big Italian area traditionally is called Taylor Street. Um, you'll see on some maps today, they'll call it like, oh, the University Village or other things referring to a university that was built there in the 1960s, the University of Illinois campus in Chicago is there, but people from Chicago just always call the neighborhood Taylor Street because it's the main street that runs through the neighborhood that everything's centered around there. Um, and as you'll see, it's kind of near the downtown and runs west from downtown and still has a lot of Italian churches and festivals and restaurants um, that dominate as you see like Italian lemonade stands, Italian festivals. And so even today, even after you know, more than 100, 100 to 150 years, um, even though it's more diverse because the university brings all types of people to settle the neighborhood students, um, a lot of families who are there permanently who aren't just students, um, a lot of the Italian families still live there. Um, continuing west of there, Garfield Park became a center for a lot of Irish settlements. And this is actually my family's background that my ancestors settled in this area because they came in the turn of the century. So whereas older Irish settlement was on the north side and south side, this next wave of Irish came around the turn of the century. A lot of them settled on the west side here. And Garfield Park's famous for some very important buildings in its park. This beautiful building here is actually the field house for the park. It's a public building where they have things like the pool, the gymnasiums, the classrooms for kids to take art and dance lessons, it's, it's in the park. So it's a public building for everyone to use, as well as the conservatory, which is um, on one of the largest in America, I'm sure, but it's a glass building with many different rooms, with different types of climates in them, with plants from all over the world. Growing together. I'll show you this building here. These are very typical apartments, not just of Garfield Park, but of a lot of Chicago, where a lot of Chicagoans live in what are called two flats or three flats. And it means that, for instance, these are two flats. So it's a two-story building and one floor, the entire floor is one apartment for one family. 
whereas the other floor is another apartment for the other family. There are three story ones called three flats. Um, they also have like six flats that are three stories, but one on each side. But this is a very, very, very common part of Chicago. We don't have as many people living in big, tall, high rise buildings like Asana has because, well, it's an older city. So a lot was built before there were elevators. Um, so people didn't want to live in buildings that were 10 stories tall and have to hike up 10 flights of stairs. So our, uh, it's very common to have these two flat and three flat buildings in the city. Um, south of that, in an area called Lawndale was heavily settled by Jewish uh, immigrants from places in uh, Central Europe and in modern day Russia and that. Um, so a lot of them tended to own their own businesses. So you'll notice a lot of the houses and buildings were a bit nicer than say in the Irish area where a lot of them were employees working in industry or in other companies. Um, but they also had beautiful parks like Douglas Park and the neighborhood still has lots of buildings that were synagogues. And you can't see too well on here, but if I could zoom in, you would see that there are Star of David in the stained glass here and the Ten Commandments in Hebrew up here on top. But if you can read it, I don't know if I can zoom in somehow. Um, let me see if I can do that. If I can zoom in, I might be able to. Because um, it's interesting to note, and this is part of the history that we'll, we'll get into a little bit later, um, is that this synagogue that is in that neighborhood, sorry, while well, my, my internet's loading here, <laughs> maybe I can see if there's any more questions over here. Um, yeah, Douglas Park, that's the, the main park in that neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, it'd be great to share your experiences um, when we get closer to the, or when, when we're finishing up the presentation, maybe. So here, um, I don't know if I can zoom in though, because I don't have official PowerPoints on my computer. I had to wipe out all my applications because my computer was kind of wonky. So, sorry, I can't zoom in, but you'll see it's called Stone Temple Baptist Church. And all these synagogues in this neighborhood are not synagogues anymore. They are, for the most part, they're churches. And as we move through Chicago history, I'll explain to you why that's the case. Um, but the buildings themselves with all this Jewish architecture are still there. Um, farther southwest of the city is an area that was settled by Czechs and Slovaks or Bohemians uh, is the older word for the Czechs. In Pilsen, I don't know if you know, Pilsen is a city in Czech Republic today. This was named after that, um, as well as other places on the lower west side here. So the architecture still these kind of like very ornamental uh, pediments at the tops of buildings and the very narrow buildings like that might be reminiscent of Prague if you've ever been there. A lot of the architecture is very similar to Prague and Central Europe because the people who settled there built it in the style they were familiar with. So that's another aspect of what makes every neighborhood different is that the people who would settle there first and build it, a lot of times the architecture, which is there today a hundred or more years later, shows the country that those immigrants came from. Farther north uh, around Humboldt Park was settled a lot by Scandinavians as well as Germans. And why if you go to the park today, you'll notice the architecture of the buildings reflects that. These are inside of Humboldt Park. It's another big, very beautiful park. Also a lot of the churches, um, there's a lot more Lutheran churches up in these areas because those are the people that settled there and settled again in two flats or in small brick cottages and bungalows. Um, and lastly, a neighborhood that is, it's, the name of the neighborhood is Ukrainian Village. So you can guess who settled there. A lot of Ukrainians uh, settled that region. And again, you'll see dominating it is the St. Nicholas Church that's today it still dominates the neighborhood. Um, again, a lot of these bungalow and cottage style houses um, and today, this is a modern photo going down the street. It's normal to see Ukrainian flags flying outside the houses because a lot of families still live there um, for generations. They've been living there and maintaining a lot of the culture, uh, their connection to Ukrainian culture, even if they've been in America for three, four, five generations. Um, but the West Side then became this very, very, very diverse mixed part of the city with all different people from all over the world settling side by side and being neighbors with each other. And there's more even, but I'm just giving you some of the, some of the most famous who dominated. So kind of moving through Chicago's history, 
the next phase, I called it the second city because by the turn of the century, by 1900, Chicago was in almost all respects number two to New York. New York was of course, and is still today, America's main city, the biggest city, the center of business and banking and entertainment. Well, not movies, that's in Hollywood, but a lot of other entertainment like Broadway and theater. Um, there are a lot of movies and TV shows made in New York though. Uh, but Chicago was in almost every respect the number two most important, the number two biggest city, the number two for business, the number two for um, almost all respects after New York. And so it was kind of like able to stand on that as a proud point for a good part, the, basically the first half of the 20th century. But Chicago is also going to experience a lot of change. One thing that's important in large cities is there's constant change. People are always moving. People, new people arriving, people who've been there moving to different parts. And some of what defines Chicago a lot in this time period, since it had become so industrial, is what I'll call the ethnic blue collar neighborhoods. That blue collar is a term used in America to refer to people who are, they're not poor, but they're not rich either. They work every day in order to support their families and to take care of themselves. So um, neighborhoods that hold on to their ethnic sense of being, like we said, Irish, Ukrainian, Italian, Jewish. Um, also at this time, we're gonna have two, what are called great migrations. One, 1910s and 20s, and then again in the 50s and 60s, which are going to have a big impact on Chicago. And that's in this next slide here. Um, the great migrations refer to a time in America when African-Americans moved in huge numbers, hundreds of thousands, moving from the southern part of the United States to the northern part. Um, I don't know if, how much people know about American history, but most African-Americans' ancestors came to America um, as slaves and were settled in the southern part of the U.S., where plantations used slave labor to grow cotton, tobacco, um, sugar, rice. And so... By the time the Civil War happened in the 1860s, and even for a generation or two afterwards, almost all Black Americans lived in rural or farmlands in the South. And um, after being freed in 1860, most of them did not have the money or the education or the connections to go anywhere. So a lot of times they just stayed, now they weren't legally slaves, but they were just very poor farm workers working on farms owned by white people and paid just enough to survive. So even though they weren't legally slaves, um, their lives had changed very, very little. And after you know, a generation, two generations, many of them realized that this was never gonna change where they were. And that opportunity lay for them in these Northern cities where industrial jobs were demanding labor. They needed people to come to work in the ind industries in the North. And so in addition to immigrants coming from other countries, lots and lots of black Americans um, would you know, work and save to get a train ticket to travel north to cities. And um, Chicago, you'll notice, was transformed a lot. So in 1910, how much of Chicago was African-American? A mere 2%, it was very small. Even though the city at that time had over 2 million people living in it, only 2% were black. By 1930, it would grow to seven. By 1950, 14. By 1980, it was 40%, close to half the city. So these two great migrations really uh, changed a lot of the dynamic of the city by adding another culture to it. Um, by the way, I'll back up a little. I'll show you the dates here. Just a quick little overview of why were there these migrations. Well, the 19 teens and 20s saw World War I, which was major industrial output for the war, so lots of industrial jobs, and at the same time as a lot of young men went off to fight in the war, followed by the 1920s was a boom time in the American economies. So a lot of black uh, Americans from the South decided this was drawing them North to settle. Then end of 1920s, we have the stock market crash and the Great Depression, which means um, it was a time when there was very few jobs and many, many people had no jobs and had no money. So there wasn't uh, an attraction or a draw for, um, for people to move to the North, followed by World War II. But then after that war, we again, then again experience an industrial boom in the Midwestern part of America, lots of jobs attracting people again. So we have another big migration in the 50s and 60s. 
Um, at the same time, there's the civil rights movement happening in the South, which meant a lot of, um, how should I say, upheaval, um, a lot of conflicts, a lot of Black people, whether or not they were actively involved, a lot of them faced violence and reprisal or people trying to fight back against civil rights. So a lot of them left the South for the North, thinking that there would be better opportunity as well. Um, so that again, um, a lot of them settled on the South side in the first great migration, settling mostly in regions straight south of downtown, down here in the Eastern parts, close to the lake. So this becomes known as I put here, the first great migration, World War I up until 1929, when the stock market crashed and the country entered a depression. They settled a lot along uh, these streets that ran, ran straight south from downtown. And the area, one of the central parts was called Bronzeville because initially a lot of Chicagoans saw many, many black people moved in and called it the Black Belt. But a lot of black people took offense to that saying, well, we're not all black, we're all different shades of colors of brown and tan and, and some are very dark black, but they said bronze is a better term. And so the neighborhood became known as Bronzeville and became a center for African-American culture and business. And some of the houses down there were built by business owners. You'll see some are very big, very beautiful homes because a lot of, um, a lot of these early settlers were able to build their own businesses and become kind of a center of a black metropolis on the south side of Chicago here um, between the Bridgeport was off to the west and the lakefront to the east. Um, other areas that were settled a lot in the south side at this time were those ethnic blue collar areas. And so Polonia, referring to a lot of the Polish that came to Chicago, an expansion of the south side Irish and also large Lithuanian immigrants. And remember the original South Side area was here in Bridgeport, but lots more are gonna come and they're gonna expand down Southwest here and a bit farther to the South. So the Union stockyards where I said all those animals were getting butchered and processed, which provided jobs for tens of thousands of people um, were right over here, just kind of Southwest of Bridgeport. So even a neighborhood's called back of the yards because it was back of or behind the stockyards. But a lot of industry developed along this corridor because of railroads slicing through and the canal slicing through. And so a lot of the architecture today, Polish churches, Lithuanian churches, um, a lot of Irish heritage in this corridor down here, southwest um, of Chicago, uh, was built up by those people. And you can still see it a lot. And like I said, the architecture of the, the region. Um, and also, by the way, I didn't put on here, a lot of the second wave of, of African-American migrants in the 50s and 60s did not settle though on the South side. We'll talk about in the next slide where they settled. So in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, Chicago is actually going to experience a population decline, but it's not because people were leaving Chicago altogether. It's because of suburbanization. And that just means people taking the opportunity as cars became more common and highways were built to move just outside of the city to the towns and the, the communities around Chicago, but not in the city itself. So a lot of these were white communities who their second or third generation after immigrating had grown from being very poor immigrants to being very middle class Americans who could afford to buy a house in the suburbs and commute on their car into the city. Also though, what sadly started happening in especially the 60s, 70s, 80s was a lot of the industries started uh, closing down as jobs went maybe overseas to Asia or to plants down in the Southern part of America. So I'm gonna check the chat again, see if there's any, um, any effect, any questions here, by the way, <laughs> not, not getting too far away. So about African-Americans bringing words, one thing that's actually very interesting in Chicago is that, um, our, the African-American communities tend to be nearly 100% African-Americans. Other communities are a bit more mixed, but the Black communities tend to be um, pretty homogenous. And so, whereas other groups will affect each other and I guess start talking more of a Chicago way, um, a lot of the Black communities, even if they've lived in Chicago for three, four generations, they still have a lot of the influence of the Southern way of talking. And you can hear the way most Black people talk as being distinct from how like the rest of Chicago talks, like other ethnic groups, white, Hispanic, all kind of influencing each other and living more together. Whereas the Black way of speaking is very, very distinct because they tend to live in communities that are more homogenous, um, which means like, 
almost all black people just living in the neighborhood together. So they sound more Southern effect on their way of talking hasn't changed as much over time. Oh, Anyways, this, the latter part is, yeah? There is also a question from Anastasia uh, who asked, like, can the term Yankee be offensive? Oh, no, it's actually, a, it's a historic term. It's not really offensive at all. The word term Yankee just means like from the Northeastern United States, like New England. Um, even the baseball team in New York is called the Yankees. So it's not offensive at all. It's, it's not used to talk about people today, though. It's a historic term. So we use it to talk about those first settlers who came, the first white settlers who settled in Chicagoland, because it was a term historically. But you would not really call people today Yankees. It's, it's, it's a historic thing. You learn in history class. Um, so if like you call somebody Yankee, it won't have any offensive connotation. So it's like, okay, right? I mean, yeah, it's not okay. offensive. It, it's not it, like gringo like in Mexico. Oh, gringo no, no, like, no, 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 it's no, a different. no, no, not at all. It's not offensive at all. It just sounds kind of awkward if you use it to talk about someone today because it's just not, a, it's not really modern. It, it's just something we talk about in history class. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, thanks for the answer. Yeah, no worries. So Chicago, I put a map here of what we term Chicago land. When you say Chicago land, we're talking about the city and all these suburbs that wrap around it. The people who um, live in communities that are all around Chicago, where there really, there's no farms anymore. It's all residential built up areas. And they have this strong connection to the city, either because they moved from the city or they work in the city, um, or they, when they go on the weekends to go out to eat or to go to the theater, they travel into the city. So this strong connection to the whole area. Um, and one of the main things is between Chicago and a lot of these communities, there's no farms anymore. It's just constantly built up. And just to show you how much Chicago was shrinking in the late half of the 20th century, but Chicago land was always growing. People weren't moving away from Chicago altogether. They were just moving to the areas nearby. So the city in 1950 had a population of 3.6 million. 40 years later, it was 2.8. So a lot of people left the city proper. But when you look at the city and its suburbs, in 1950, it was five and a half million people. But by 1990, you had 8.1 million. So people weren't leaving Chicago to go to other parts of America. I mean, obviously some were, but the vast majority that were leaving Chicago were just going to suburban areas around at the same time as people were always moving to Chicago from other countries um, and other parts of America. So Chicago changed a lot as this time went on. How does it change? Well, the West side, which remember had all those different ethnicities of Jews and Irish and Italian and, um, Scandinavians and Germans, it transforms as a lot of those people move farther out to the suburbs. And a lot of the areas in the central part get settled by African Americans. And that was that second great migration in the 50s and 60s. So areas like Garfield Park and Austin and Lawndale get transformed from being Irish, Italian and Jewish to being almost all African American. And that's why like I pointed out, the synagogues in Lawndale today are mostly black churches. The same building is there with that Jewish architecture, but now it's like an African Methodist Episcopal church, but it'll still have the Hebrew carved in the stone on the building because of that. Um, so it's interesting. And then like Humboldt Park, which were the Germans and Scandinavians, became a center for Puerto Rican settlements in the 1950s and 60s. So the architecture might still look very German, very Scandinavian, but many people moving from Puerto Rico to the mainland United States settled this area and changed just the character of the neighborhood. You know, now it's Puerto Rican restaurants and you'll drive down the street, you'll hear Puerto Rican music playing in the summer. Um, and it's important, I don't know how many of you know this, I'm not using the word immigrating when I talk about Puerto Ricans because Puerto Rico is part of the United States. So when people move from Puerto Rico, they're not immigrating to America. They're just moving from the island to the mainland of the United States. Um, but they settled heavily in this part of Chicago and kind of transforming a lot of the character of the neighborhood. And this is what happens. Neighborhoods are always changing. Every generation or two, a neighborhood might be totally different people living there than who lived there before. It's part of what makes the dynamic and living nature of Chicago what it is. So 
Chicago since the 1990s. It's continued to change a lot. Um, and some of the biggest changes are, well, I'm terming reverse migration, which means a lot of people moving from the suburbs back into the city or people whose parents moved to the suburbs and they grew up in the suburbs, but as adults, they moved back into the city. And tied to this is this term gentrification, which basically means um, neighborhoods that have become poorer and less, less maintained um, and maybe even saw a lot of population decline, people moving in who are um, educated professionals with more money and they fix up the neighborhood and make it nicer, also more expensive, also wealthier. Um, also, a lot more diverse immigration coming at this time because primarily immigrants coming since the 1990s are coming a lot more from Latin America as well as Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. Although we'll have some immigrants coming from everywhere, really. So for instance, this is a map of the city of Chicago with its neighborhoods, the familiar shape, you, or you might be familiar with it by this point after this presentation. This is a map, I believe the year 2000, of racial groups. It doesn't break down to particular nationalities, but just racially where the color red represents people who identify as white. You'll see that's a lot of the north side as well as a lot of the suburbs. Blue, which is African-American, a lot of the south side and spread farther south as well as still on the west side. Um, green being Asian, and we have our Chinatown famously down here, but also on the north side, a lot of green pockets spreading out and orange being Latino Hispanic communities. Like I said, that Humble Park Puerto Rican community, but then growing and expanding farther west as well as the Southwest corridor as many, many Mexicans immigrate to Chicago, making us um, a center for Mexican culture. Let me check if there's questions here again. Is there any link where I can leave feedback? I'm guessing maybe here in the, <laughs> the chat or um, I'm not sure if there will be in the end. But anyways, we're, we're getting close to modern history in Chicago here. Gentrification, like I said, is the young professionals moving from the suburbs or a lot of times after college, people come from Ohio and Michigan and Minnesota. They settle because Chicago's the big central city for the Midwestern, the central part of the United States. We got a huge influx of Latino immigrants, especially from Mexico. Um, and then like I said, Asian immigrants and a continuing flow of Polish immigrants that has never really stopped in Chicago. So Mexican immigrants came to Chicago. A lot of them spread in these areas farther west from where the Puerto Rican community was. And a lot of them settled in this southwestern corridor that previously had been a lot of Irish and Polish and Lithuanian, now is transformed into strong Mexican communities. So Pilsen, which was Czech, is known as you know, the heart of Mexican Chicago. These areas down here, Gage Park, Brighton Park, McKinley Park, used to be very Irish, very Polish along what's called Archer Avenue down here is now very, very Mexican. So much so that there are cities in the, the southwestern US near the border of Mexico, El Paso, Tucson, that percentage wise, they have a higher percentage Mexican population. But because Chicago is so big in terms of numbers of Mexican, the number one Mexican city in America in terms of numbers is Los Angeles. And number two is Chicago. So even though they were the third biggest city in America, we're the second largest Mexican city in America. So it's, it's a big part of what's defining Chicago today is that everyone lives nearby, knows, goes to school with, works with um, lots and lots of Mexican people who have integrated also very much into Chicago. You find Mexicans in almost every neighborhood in Chicago. These are neighborhoods that are mostly Mexican, but you will find Mexicans settling everywhere. For lack of a better way of describing it, I just say they get along with everybody and everyone gets along with them. So um, it's, it's easy to have Mexicans as your neighbors in Chicago. So they're affecting the culture a lot. Now, whereas a lot of the earlier Poles back in 100 years ago settled in the Southwestern Corridor, in the latter part of the 20th century, and even today, a lot more settled up in the farther Northwest part of Chicago along what's called Milwaukee Avenue up here. So where I'm from up here in Norwood Park, uh, you, when I was a child, I remember it being Irish and Italians for the most part, that there were some Polish people, but now it seems like it's a lot more Irish and Polish with some Italians because so many Polish people have moved into the Northwest and even Northwest suburbs. Um, and it's just, again, a part of what helps to create this ever-changing dynamic in these neighborhoods 
that Norwood Park, where I'm from, was settled by Scandinavians and Protestant Germans. Then it became Irish and Italians moving from the west side. Now it's a lot of Irish and Polish settling up there. So um, neighborhoods are always, always changing. And this is a Polish center that's in Jefferson Park here. Kind of this neighborhood's like the heart of the Northwest side Polish community. Um, another big part of settlement in Chicago are Southeast Asians. We do have a Chinatown down here on the South side. I'm just, I'm more familiar with the North side because I'm from the Northwest side. So I'm more familiar with Southeast Asians growing up going to Thai restaurants and enjoying Filipino food and knowing Filipinos. Cause up here on the North side, we have a large communities of an area called Little Vietnam up here in Uptown, um, as well as lo lots and lots of people from Thailand, from the Philippines. They settle in various parts of the city, but up in this area of Edgewater and Lincoln Square, um, lots of, you know, Rogers Park, lots of people from Southeast Asia, bringing again their culture, their food, um, kind of mixing with and adding to what makes Chicago an ever more diverse city. Uh, this, by the way, is just a picture I showed. Gentrification then also changing a lot of neighborhoods, especially on the north side and the near west side, west side close to downtown, where neighborhoods had become pretty poor and run down, um, are being transformed. This is a picture of housing projects, which were government owned buildings, particularly for very poor people, being eventually torn down because they actually were not very good for anybody. Most people who lived in them realize they moved in hoping, the government was hoping to help people get out of poverty, but they ended up making neighborhoods where people were kind of locked into poverty. Um, and they were tended to be very dangerous, lots of crime. So getting torn down, but what was being built in their place are pretty expensive, very nice new homes um, being settled a lot by people moving, like I said, from suburbs, from other parts of America and transforming these neighborhoods into much wealthier neighborhoods where there's not an ethnic dynamic because they are from various suburbs or very parts so much more mixed tending to be mostly white though but not really like specifically ukrainian or greek or anything like that um so that's happening currently and presentation there is so much to cover there are a lot of neighborhoods i did not talk about and they all have their own story and their own history and their character um, I just thought if I talk about a few various different ones, it's a good way of introducing you to not only what some of Chicago's neighborhoods are like, but also how they're always changing um, from generation to generation. Some are, some have held on. Some of those, there are small pockets of North Side Irish, North Side Germans that still persist. Um, there's a neighborhood called up here, Lincoln Square, where there still is this strong sense of Germanness. That neighborhood down here, that Bridgeport, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, um, the west part is now mostly Mexican. The northeast part is a lot of Chinese. But the southeast part, my sister lives there with her husband, who is Southside Irish, and his family has lived in that neighborhood for many generations. And most of the people of Irish have lived in that neighborhood for many generations. But there's other neighborhoods that are completely transformed. You don't find Czechs in a, a neighborhood called Pilsen. There's very few Bohemians there. It's almost all Mexican now, for instance. Um, or Norwood Park, where I'm from. The historic buildings will say Norwegian and Danish on them, but it became Irish and Italian for a good part of the 20th century, and now it's a lot of Polish immigrants. So it's always, always changing, but it's such a dynamic city and why it's so interesting to visit and travel around Chicago. You get to experience a whole world in, in this one city and even over time see how it changes as the communities interact with each other. Um, and this is why on that first slide I said a mosaic and a melting pot. You may have heard this term melting pot referring to the United States before because it refers to if you have a pot on the stove and you're putting all these ingredients and cooking them together they start to kind of melt together and give their flavors to each other and you don't have potatoes and carrots and beef and cabbage anymore, you have a stew, you have a soup, you have a new thing that has its own character. And that's so much of what America is. What makes America, America is all the different people that have come to it and that continue to come. So that America wasn't made at any one point, it's always being made by all the new people coming into it. But one thing about Chicago is that it's also a lot like a mosaic. 
And this is a mosaic here that I found of Chicago buildings here. So it represents Chicago. And if you zoomed into it, you'd see that this mosaic is yellow, and this one is blue, and this one is orange, and this one is white, and this one is brown. So each one of them still has its own character, but put together, it makes this picture that makes one image. And that's a lot what Chicago's like, that each neighborhood has such a unique character that is all its own, and that is made from the people who settled there maybe a long time ago, or people who just arrived there, but when you put it all together, it makes Chicago what it is as a city as well. So it's such an interesting place in all of its pieces and, and as a whole. So it's like a melting pot, but it's also like a mosaic. And I have some links here. If you, I, I'm sure I, we can make this public that um, just kind of some interesting sites I found that go through neighborhoods, different neighborhoods telling their history and describing them. Um, the first three are about the city. The last one's particularly about the north side. Um, which has some of the most interesting neighborhoods because people live most densely on the north side. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a, a, an introduction, as I said, really just an introduction to, to Chicago. So I know a lot of you had questions along the way, um, but I'd love to add any more if you, there was something you were hoping I would talk about but I didn't get to and you wanna ask about or you want to share with the group because maybe you know you've learned about Chicago or you've traveled there and you wanna share something that I just didn't have time to share in this presentation. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. So I don't know if you wanna type those in the box or just speak up what's best here. Uh, Joel, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And I yes. think, uh, uh, our participants got inspired by this, uh, so we are all willing to visit Chicago now, those who, who still has not. Uh, and we have a participant, Bahadur, I hope he is still here to share his experience of being there. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, just, just a moment, let me just... Uh change the background because the previous one is from our Toastmasters club so then put something something uh, of the vitamin C on the background uh, yeah thank you just wanted to share uh, with you uh, and reflect a little bit uh, on my trip to Chicago last year um, uh, yeah Shireen thank you very much yes my name is Bahadir uh, and uh, I can relate uh, to so many moments uh, in the presentation of Joe's uh, because uh, actually I, I had uh, two uh, experiences of, tr uh, of traveling to America and both of them uh, were uh, somehow reflected uh, in Joe's presentation. Like remember that slide uh, with a uh, US map, uh, the migration routes that go from south uh, to the north. So actually the first time I came to, to US, uh, I've been in the city of Cincinnati, uh, where we studied this effect of gentrification, uh, where uh, well, actually one of the feature of the f gentrification, and it's a social phenomenon is that when the, the uh, city uh, uh, government wants to, to like, you know, to upscale, to, to make the neighborhood better, they, they have to, uh, you know, to move out people who live there, uh, those uh, poor, poor people, poor Americans, uh, because, as, uh, because they, they need to actually, you know, uh, demolish uh, the, uh, you know, those buildings and, and build a, a nice, a nice skyscrapers there. So we studied that. Uh, and um, uh, why I'm telling you about my past experiences, because this time I, I also been in Chicago. Overall, I have this, uh, you know, a, a, a tourist uh, tour uh, in New York and Miami, but uh, I went to Chicago on, on the same purpose to, to study NGOs uh, who, you know, who, who try to revert this, um, this uh, social stigma on, on African Americans, uh, which makes them, you know, go over this vicious cycle uh, of uh, having no good job, uh, because uh, uh, you know, as as one of the one of the things that's ha that happened now uh, across uh, uh, several uh, you know places in America, and and, it, and this includes Chicago as well. Uh, maybe for the reasons that uh, Joe mentioned, uh, that uh, African Americans now uh, uh, comprise 
uh, more than 40% of, of Chicago's uh, inhabitants. Uh, th there is a, a term uh, that, is, uh, that is called uh, institutional racism. It, it mean, I, I mean, uh, the, the racism uh, does not exist in, in America anymore, but uh, it, uh, it just uh, transformed in a different form. And let me just uh, show it, uh, like, uh, tell it in the example, uh, like uh, when a, a black person wants to get a job, a good job, office job maybe, uh, 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 when the recruiter looks at, at his CV, uh, he can see that he's from a certain neighborhood, like for example, the Englewood neighborhood uh, where I visited, and this is what Joe referred to, one of the neighborhoods uh, where uh, African-Americans densely live. Uh, so, so the recruiter uh, might think that uh, because he's from that neighborhood, probably uh, his relatives uh, you know, are tied some, to some criminal gangs. And even if that, uh, uh, he deserves that job, uh, the, you know, the, the employer might have uh, possible problems with, with that guy in the future. So it, it puts him to a low paid job. And then you know, uh, some, some, of, uh, some of those people uh, go to jail. And then you know, this loop starts all over again. Uh, so, uh, so I visited a couple of NGOs, and some of them were in that. They were located in that uh, neighborhoods, uh, the the Englewood neighborhood. Uh, they were transforming the society. And and what I liked about this Englewood, which is uh, actually one of the neighborhoods in, in Chicago, uh, is is that uh, I think the population of that neighborhood is around uh, sixty thousand people. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, yeah, it, it is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, the neighborhood with, with uh, one of the highest uh, rates of uh, criminal incidents uh, in Chicago. But on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of NGOs that, that really work with people who live there to, you know, you know to pull them out of, the, of this uh, poverty that makes them become criminal. And, and, and overall, I, I liked uh, the experience uh, of, of that neighborhood. Uh, we went uh, over it uh, and we've seen uh, so many beautiful places in, in, in the Englewood uh, neighborhood. Uh, and and uh, another one neighborhood uh, that, that I've been to while I was in Chicago was, uh, I think it was called the Kimball. Uh, it's maybe not a, a big neighborhood, but just a micro district like that. They, they have, uh, you know, uh, it, it consists of all those two-story buildings, uh, residential buildings that uh, you've also seen in the Joe's presentation. Uh, and uh, I love that neighborhood because, uh, you know, it, it creates that, uh, that feeling of, um, you know, uh, of, you know, it, it's, not, it's not like a uh, very modern, uh, you know, concrete uh, and steel uh, type of, of the city like New York, but but rather a neighborhood where where people uh, really live uh, and you know uh, live very close in, uh, in the community, and I think that uh, that um, uh, Kendall uh, neighborhood uh, it, it was mostly inhabited uh, by Latin Americans because I've seen uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, little cafes and restaurants that were off, uh, offering this uh, Mexican food, uh, which I'm a fan of. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I even had uh, uh, dinner twice uh, in, in those uh, in those restaurants, and, and they were uh, very very yummy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank thank you very much. Thanks for giving me a word. Yeah. Well, thank you for contributing. It's great to hear um, that you had so much experience in Chicago to share with everyone. And I, I'll just add one thing about that cycle of poverty that you mentioned. Um, I kind of mentioned this when someone asked about whether African-Americans added a lot to the Chicago lingo and how we talk. Um, like you mentioned, there's not legal segregation. There's not a law saying black people have to live separate from others, but kind of like some of the, the habits that have formed of where people settle. In Chicago, if you talk about a white neighborhood, a Latino neighborhood, a Asian neighborhood, it'll still be mixed to a certain degree. If it's a white neighborhood, you might say it still might only be 75% white people and then mixed otherwise. Whereas when you talk about an African-American or black neighborhood, those tend to be close to 100% African-American. And this is something else that, that is an issue in a lot of Chicago neighborhoods of people in those poor African-American neighborhoods feeling um, 
a bit trapped because they don't tend to connect as much with the outside world as other neighborhoods connect with each other. And it's not, there's no law dictating it. It's a lot of just kind of the, the I don't know, habits that have developed amongst people in different communities. Um, and there are some middle class and some even wealthy uh, black neighborhoods. I can show, I don't know if everyone sees the full screen still, but um, a lot of areas down here are very middle class black areas. This area of Beverly, it's a lot of Irish, but it's also a lot of African Americans who are very wealthy, as well as down here in Hyde Park and areas where the Obamas live, for instance, called Jackson Park Highlands, where they're millionaire mansions. But there are a lot of very, very poor uh, black neighborhoods, especially inland here and up on the west side over here. Um, so yeah, that's just one aspect is that, that um, not legal or institutional segregation, but just kind of a cultural habit that has formed of black neighborhoods being more segregated from the rest of the city that has, has unfortunately um, affected a lot of them negatively. Well, thank you very, very much, Joe. It was wonderful. And I appreciate a lot, like all the hard work you put on this presentation. So we learned a lot. There is a lot of information. It's rich with all this like historical background and all the way to the modern back, you know, like situation right now. And I've never been to, I think I've been to Chicago only or on the plane. Like we had like one night um, layover, but we didn't have a chance to go to the city or do much. But now I think we should do uh, one trip only to uh, visit all this neighborhood neighborhoods that you mentioned. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for letting me be a part of this, for inviting me. I, I, I feel honored. Yes, oh. it was very wonderful. And I think many of the participants learned a lot of, like we all learn a lot of uh, neighborhoods, a lot of <coughs> facts. Uh, so if, then does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, I do have last question. So uh, about the uh, hot dogs in Ch Chicago, what's so special about them, about the hot dogs? Like, I know I've heard something like it's like super special, but I'm not sure. Do you uh -huh. eat um, like, you know, like with a mustard, without mustard? Like, can you tell more yeah. about that if it's possible? Yeah. Yeah. It's an important part of our culture, Chicago style hot dogs. So first of all, okay. First is the hot dog. So um, it has to be kosher, all beef hot dogs, that Chicagoans won't eat hot dogs that have just anything in it. I think part of it is, you know, we were a meat packing town, so we know good meat from poor quality meat. And somehow early on, the first people to bring hot dogs, I think came from, I mean, Vienna is one of the biggest companies in Chicago. Vienna hot dogs came from Central Europe, but they were Jews. And so a standard Chicago hot dog starting off with 100% all beef. So there's no pork or any other meats in there. It's a kosher hot dog. And then we love to put everything from the garden on the hot dog. So they'll have mustard, pickles, uh, relish, onions, tomatoes. If you want hot peppers, some people put that, put that on there. Some people put cucumbers, celery salt. Um, but there's only one thing that's not allowed on a Chicago hot dog. Does anyone know Let what that guess. is? Let me guess. Ketchup? Exactly. Yeah, if you're a small right. child, yeah, if you're a small child, it's okay. But by the time a person reaches, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, they need to outgrow that. A Chicagoan thinks then it's just a sin to put ketchup on a hot dog because of the way it affects the flavor of the hot dog itself. You lose a lot of the flavor of the hot dog that's overpowered. Whereas yeah. all these other ingredients, we think it kind of um, accentuates the taste of the hot dog. So that's a Chicago hot dog. It's big, not big, it's not big, sorry. It's just, it has everything on it. It has tons of ingredients, but no ketchup. Not ketchup, yeah, gotcha. Now that's I just remember it when you ask yeah. the final one. All beef kosher hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a participant from South Korea. Uh, would Sang Soon An uh, add something? Would like to? Um, in Korea, there's a movie called The Godfather. 
Oh, the Godfather. So I haven't seen a, a question about that, but the Godfather isn't really Chicago. That's New York. Um, there was a mafia in Chicago way back in the day. You might know the name Al Capone, the most famous mobster in our history. But um, the, specifically the, the story of the, the Godfather was like New, New Jersey, New York mafia, because they had their own mafias as well. And famously, I don't know how accurate all this is, but um, they say the Chicago mafia went down two routes. So we don't really have much of a mob anymore because part of them moved out to Las Vegas to create hotels and casinos and make their money that way. And the other half became what we call the machine. They took over the politics. So they don't need to be a mafia anymore. They're, they run the political system of the city. So they're not mafia anymore. They're just all very um, interconnected. You know, a lot of our, our city politics are people who are from the same neighborhoods and went to school together. A lot of them are even related to each other. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but as, as to the as to the the Godfather was technically New York Mafia, not Chicago Mafia. I don't know. If, I, I I don't know if I need to scroll and see lots of other questions. If there's anything else. Mm hmm. Are there many, uh, are there any questions? I think there are no in the chat box. Um, well. Thank you for all your, your compliments. A lot of people I'm scrolling through seeing for questions and people are, I'm glad that my presentation was interesting for you and that it helped you to get a better understanding of, of Chicago and its history and culture. I have one more question, I guess the last one. Um, I don't remember, I've read somewhere, but there was a say, like the saying, uh, how to check if you have their um, Chicago accent, like uh, they don't pronounce like the R sound, like in a park, like basically say. Oh, that, that's like, New York. <laughs> that's New York, you think? Okay, but I thought it was in Chicago or something, like in a park or, okay. Maybe I just confused. Anyways. We do have a way of speaking that I really didn't notice until I, I personally, when I moved overseas and left America, um, because I'm not around it. Now when I go back, I can hear how people talk a bit more. They say, I mean, it's hard to say all things, but we say like very strong, like a eh and ah sounds <laughs> that are also a bit more nasally. Um, Head? I don't know like, how else, like, like the cats, instead of like cat, it's like cat. Uh -huh. Like a dog and a cat. Uh -huh. um, can, yeah, can, you, can you say some sentences I, in the Chicago dialects, please, Joe? I don't, yeah. Well, it's funny, too, to even say one Chicago way, because I can hear a difference between people from the north part of the city where I'm from and the south siders. Like I said, two of my sisters married south side Irish, and I can hear how they speak differently being from south of Roosevelt Road. Um, I don't know what, what I would say that would be like a Chicagoan's way of talking. Or a specific maybe phrase that would um person from Chicago would say. Like for example in New York, they say, forget about it. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> forget about it. Like, you know. Is there any specific like phrase or I don't know? It's it's actually it's hard when you're from a place because everything mm -hmm. just sounds normal to me. I wouldn't know if anything was like specifically Chicago and because everything to me is just normal. Uh -huh. Um, oh, I see. Oh, yeah. I see uh, some comments from Denise, who's also from uh -huh. Chicago. So, uh -huh. okay. She typed up F-R-O-N-T-R-O-O-M. If we say those words separately, there's front and there's mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. And the same with the room you sleep in. You can say bed and you can say room. But we tend to merge these together. So it's front room and bedroom. So uh, okay. and front room, bedroom. When I was in college, my parents moved into a new house and we had to do a lot of tearing down walls and ceiling and taking up the carpeting to redo a lot of the inside. And I was talking with friends in school about it. And someone asked like, Oh, how's it going? And I said, Oh yeah, we had to do all this work in the front room and the dining room, taking down the walls and tearing up the floor. And one of the guys said, not he's, he, he's like, stop, stop. You've been saying this for like three weeks and I'm, I never understand what you're talking about. What is a French room? <laughs> you thought I was saying French, like from France. Yeah, like French. Said, what's the French room? And I'm like, the French room. He's like, yeah, what is a French room? I'm like, I don't know. What is a French room? I, 
what are you talking about? And then he's like, you talk about the French room. I'm like, no, the front room. But he was from a different part of America. So he actually was confused. Okay, gotcha. So, front and then, room. yeah, I know a guy is just saying for like anything. Like we all have connections. We all know the best at this and the best at that. I know a guy. If you need something done, work on your house or you need a dentist. Like, yeah, I know a guy. Because everyone's guy. from the neighborhood. Yeah, and everyone who's from the neighborhood you're from is the best compared to being from other parts of the city. Definitely. Yeah. That's sure. true of now, every neighborhood. So now I can say I know a guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That's very funny. Thank you very much, Denise and Joe. I really enjoyed the, those dialects because mm -hmm. sometimes, you, you know, as you said, like French door, we say, but not a French room. So now I understand what, what that would French be. Room. Yeah. French room and bedroom. Um, I don't know. It's like I said, it's hard as, as off the cuff to think of what would I say that would denote that I'm a Chicagoan. I don't know. Do you miss Chicago now? You're, or are you okay in, in Astana right now? <laughs> always. No, I go home every year at Christmas and in the summer. And regardless, I always miss it whenever I'm away. So that, that's something that's never gotten less <laughs> the longer i've been away it doesn't matter i, I always miss home because home is always home of course for sure i can imagine mm -hmm. but i hope you you feel yourself good as well here in kazakhstan <laughs> yes I mean, I'm, i'm in my sixth year here that if i didn't like it i wouldn't have stayed more than one so that's it's good nice so guys it's almost Like we are actually run, run of time, but uh, Joe was so kind to agree to stay longer for half an hour and extend his presentation. And we, uh, uh, we appreciate and grateful for everyone who joined us today. And I hope you really liked it. And according to your comments, you did. And so thank you very much. Have a very nice rest of your day. And I guess in the US it's just starting. The day is just about to start, right? So have a nice day, nice weekends. Stay safe and healthy. And we will like you, like we will very much appreciate if you could fill out this survey. The link is in the chat. Uh, so it will be very helpful for us to improve. Thank you once again, Joe. <laughs> I hope to see you in our programs um, other time as well. Yeah, well, thank you again for the invitation. It's been my pleasure. And thank you everyone who has come. Thanks. So goodbye, the meeting is over. Thank you very much, Shirin. Thank you very much, Joe. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay.